And uh, Tracy Lesky, the bug lady, is what I like to call her. Uh, and uh, she did not disappoint. She actually brought bugs with her today. I Tracy, did. good morning to if you. They were, good morning. If they were spiders, you wouldn't have a co-host. <laughs> that would be something. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. She loves spiders. It's actually Dr. Tracy Lesky. She has a doctorate in this, in this stuff. In spiders. No. Well, in spiders. No, not in spiders, arachnids. but, uh, but in uh, insects, because, you know, spiders are not insects. They're arachnids. arachnids. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, this is not my first time I having know, you on. Good job. Yeah. Do you know how I know that? How? Because I got a letter from a reader where I talked, I mentioned on like page 240 in a book about spiders and and insects and i got three paragraphs on how i need to do more research because spiders are not insects they are arachnids we entomologists enjoy precision i will tell you so. <laughs> who are your guests inside your little mesh there well today these are brown marmorated stink bug adults that i collected from my backyard for future experimentation <laughs> <laughs> How many times have you heard that on the show? <laughs> Every time I'm here, usually. Yeah. Now, when you leave, Tracy, are you going to leave the stink bugs with Rob? No. no. Why not? No. Why he, not? he does not enjoy them as much as me. Yeah. Yeah. Are you, are you and sure I about think, that? Well, yeah. I, I do. I, I yeah. am pretty sure. And I think, you know, these are pretty actually pretty precious for some of our uh, wintertime mm -hmm. experiments. So, so uh, if, for those who haven't been with us in past interviews with you, could you explain? Explain the stink bug flying treadmill thing as to how you can measure where they travel. Sure, they yeah, yeah, up. yeah, I should have brought you a video. Um, <laughs> so uh, brown marmorated stink bug, an invasive species from Asia that we have been dealing with locally since 2004. 2010 was the um, explosion that a lot of people remember. Um, and since then, you know, we've learned a lot about their biology, ecology, and behavior. And one thing we learned is how far they can fly. And so the way we do that is we attach them from essentially their thorax, which is like their back, um, and we put them on a, a, a flight mill. And so they fly in circles, and each revolution we measure that. And so the insect that... <laughs> It's important. <laughs> we want to know how far they'll spread. So, uh, <laughs> yes, this is science. So we know that on average, an in, uh, a brown marmorated stink bug can easily fly one to two miles per day. And in some cases, over the course of a full day, they flew 75 miles. 75 miles in a day in a day where are they headed to well that's the good question that we still we use other weird things to figure out how far they're flying in nature what's drawing them to is are they, are they just flying for the sake of flying or are they have a destination in well they have a destination right now which is where they're going to overwinter where they're going to become non-paying tenants exactly yeah, yeah. exactly so tracy for in, in 2010 and a few years after that mm -hmm. we view them as a major threat to the mm -hmm. orchardman yeah have that has that problem been uh, addressed it has um it's still a pest in orchards but not the threat that it was yeah. in 2010 we know how to manage it better we know how to manage it sustainably and we also have natural enemies that are consuming them across the landscape so there are far fewer of them trying to enter orchards unlike 2010 where it was just this tsunami yeah. wave coming in what, what are some of the natural enemies so the the two that i think have made the biggest difference one is um trisocus japonicus which is the samurai wasp it's a tiny non-stinging wasp it's about the size of a comma on a piece of paper you wouldn't even notice it but what it does is it lays its eggs in the eggs of brown marmorated okay. stink bug it evolved with the insect in asia and so it's very keyed in on finding those egg masses um, the other is this microorganism, a microsporidial organism, Nosema medoxi, which when the brown marmorated are infected, it reduces their fecundity. They lay fewer egg masses. They don't survive as well. And so I think that's what we think. Those in combination, along with a lot of native natural enemies that we have here, like if you've ever seen praying mantids or wheel bugs or things like that consuming them. And Katie did love the egg masses. So there are a lot of players, but over time when you have an invasive species, 
um, and many more opportunities for natives to recognize it as a good meal, as well as other things that come in, just like I was describing. I would like to note that in the history of the show, this is the first time the word fecundity has been used <laughs> on the program. And I think that would be a great name for a rock band. Just throwing that out there. I, I You know, I mean, you could know semen monoxide, fecundity, uh, so many names. Is that, that hyphenated could, or is that? No, 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 no. Italicized. <laughs> There's a difference, <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah. Now, in, with some insects, we hear that they are the uh, the the concentration of the numbers is a, is in part due to the winter before a harsh mm-hmm. winter. That do we have the same thing with stink bugs? We do indeed. Okay. Um, you know, in 2014, there was the first. I think that's when they coined the term as well, the polar vortex, where we yeah. had that really cold winter. We saw very low overwintering survivorship of brown marmorated stink bugs, unlike last year where we had a pretty mild winter and they survived much better. So that also plays into just the year-to-year dynamics of, you know, the population you start out with has a big impact on what you're going to see at the end of the season. And that applies to lanternflies as well, I assume? Well, we're still trying to figure all of that out. Lanternfly are pretty new. They were first detected in Pennsylvania near Reading in 2014. They probably were there for a year or so. They came in on a shipment of stone, most likely imported from China, uh, as egg masses. And so we know that they they over well would they overwinter in the egg uh, stage. And so there is some information that maybe colder, colder temperature winters reduce survivorship. But the weird thing about lanternfly, or not weird, it's just what they do. They're I would say they're very non-discriminating on where they'll lay their egg masses. We have uh, p- one of the pictures up that you sent there. Uh, Dylan just had it up there. You oh, yes. You can see it yeah. about the uh, spotted lantern flies. So uh, now there was one at football practice the other day, mm-hmm. um, which I wasn't sure exactly what it was. Then it opened up as red inside. Yes. Yeah. And I stepped on it and squished it. Yes. They they are very pretty in some in you know just to look at them but they are invasive so i you did the right thing yeah it's kind Thank of you. it's interesting <laughs> stepping on it if you try to step on it they're very 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 fast and they'll fly maybe five uh, seven eight feet away you walk up to them and try to step on them again they're still very fast fly two or three feet well keep in after, mind i'm not in my 80s yet bill so they're not quite as quick to me <laughs> no, no, but but at about the third flight They've used all their energy, so they're well, just lying there waiting for you. Yeah, and the thing is, they hop. And that was yeah. the first uh-huh. time I saw them in 2017. Mm-hmm. I went up to Pennsylvania to work with some colleagues to take a look at them. Yeah. And it was late October, and they were still feeding on Tree of Heaven. And I was, you know, you poke them a little. Um, and they would hop. And I was like, wow, look yeah. at how far. Yeah. So we actually did a study on how far each life stage can yeah. hop. Okay. So the, the stink bug when it gets irritated with you, will spray with that horrible smell. The, <laughs> yeah, the defensive compounds, yes. Does the lantern fly have anything it does when it gets mad at you? Uh, it just hops. It doesn't have those defensive compounds, and maybe it taunts you. I don't know, but no, <laughs> but, they do not have that kind of uh, superpower, mm-hmm. unfortunately, or fortunately, I should say, for us. But then why is there expressed concern about the invasion of uh, uh, lantern flies, except the fact there's so many of them? And well, the, the biggie, and the crop that seems to be at highest risk are grapes, and particularly wine grapes and table mm. grapes, vinifera, Vitus vinifera. Um, we've done a lot of studies. We did a lot of them up at Fort Detrick in quarantine to look at the hosts that land, and when I say hosts, I mean plants that the insect can feed and survive on. And so we see that they can feed on things like black walnut, um, silver maple, sugar maple, but they survive really well on, unfortunately, vitis vinifera, which are wine grapes and table grapes. So in the absence of grapes, if you uh, removed all the tree of heaven, mm-hmm. what, would they then go to the, the, the walnuts and the other trees? They will. They will. They, um, there was some work done by colleagues up at Penn State that showed that, you know, they can make it to adulthood without tree of heaven with things like maples and willow and um, sycamore and some other things. So whether though whether not having it in the environment makes them weaker is still an open question because mm. tree of heaven certainly is their preferred do host. they kill the tree well they can maybe but here's the interesting thing and we saw the same thing with apple and peach trees 
when they feed on trees, they reduce their growth and they kind of weaken them. But if they're not there, the trees recover, which is good news, you know, because that was our concern initially was that they could be killing trees and we're not seeing that. So what do we do in, in my neighborhood? There, there's one area where I mean, thousands of these things yeah. that just kind of mount up. That's a lot of squishing, you know, that, it is a kind lot of, of squishing. So is there something we can spray on them that will, will knock them out and not kill the honeybees that are down the road? Well, see that. Yes. Yeah, so there are. Um, recommendations and you can look on some of the extension websites for those that um, would be more friendly. Some of the things that we've been looking at include what we call an entomopathogenic fungus. So it turns them into fungal goo. So Bouveria bassiana is one. Um, I don't know the the common name that you would you know buy a homeowner. Okay. I'm talking about walking down the path. Yeah, in the woods, yeah right? exactly. No okay. that's what you could spray it on them yeah. and um, I, I can provide a, a name that uh, you get from Amazon. It's called uh, uh, Fish or uh, Harris, H A R R I S, and it really works. You can put it on a tree of heaven tree, and for two or three weeks, none none are there. Then eventually they will come back. Let me just so, add that fungal goo would also be a good name for a band. It would be. You Actually, it would, would be. be. Yeah. yeah. So, but the one thing that I will point out, and this is why I, I say this with caution. Lantern flies excrete a lot of what we call honeydew, which is a very nice word for excrement. <laughs> um, and that is high in sugar. So you do get things like honeybees, but also yellow jackets. They poop sugar? Yeah, they poop sugar. Who's the person that found that poop out? Sugar could be a good name, too. Um, Who's the guy at work that tested that one? So a lot of it's insects an in <laughs> Unpaid oh, intern. Oh, oh no! I ha I sent you a picture from my intern. Sorry about that. Uh -huh. um, so, um, no, they do that, that group of insects typically because they feed on plant sap. Yeah. They they poop sugar. Okay. Poop sugar could be a good name. That's also a great name yeah. for a band. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're yeah. hitting them today. <laughs> So, Actually, you know what? That's a good radio name. Poop Sugar. <laughs> Welcome to the show. This is Poop Sugar. <laughs> that would be a late night jazz and blues show. <laughs> Dr. Tracy Lesky is our guest here from the USDA. We're talking uh, spotted lantern flies. And uh, I got a thing I want to read to you here from Heather Compton, who said, I had a new visitor on my deck yesterday in the middle of stink bugs and lantern flies. We had a locust borer. I thought it was a wasp. Oh, okay. Yeah. First yeah, off, they Heather, are, salute to you for being able to identify what the bug was. Yeah, no, that's good. And there are really nice apps now, if you're not sure, um, like iSeq, which is iNaturalist, you mm -hmm. can use and you can take a picture and it usually gives you pretty close to species. So locust borers do mimic wasp species. They have the black and yellow coloration. So that's cool. Yeah. Um, that's cool. And, and the, the website, is uh, the, the app is called what? Uh, iSeq. I seek. I have the I have the Dr. Tracy Lesky app where I just text you a picture and go, "What is this?" A lot of people use that app. <laughs> yes. What What about the European hornet? Oh yeah, yeah, they're scary, and they actually feed on the excrement, the poop sugar as well <laughs> oh, of yeah. lantern flies. So oh, some of my um, staff, when they're checking traps for a lantern fly, and the European hornets come by, oh, yeah. they're like, "Ooh." But they're more interested in the honeydew. But fortunately, they don't. They're not very aggressive and stinging. They aren't. But fortunate. they sound at night. They're frightening. They are frightened. because our native hornets do not fly at night, yeah. but European hornets yeah. do. Yeah. Time change. That's just a time change. But when they come to this country. <laughs> speaking of speaking of bees, everybody yeah. I know, the admiral, and we've had some in all of my neighbors. Are yellow jackets particularly aggressive and huge this year, and why? So. You ask a fantastic question, and um, yes, lots and lots of anecdotal reports on um, yellow jackets being very pervasive this year. One hypothesis is that the honeydew produced by lanternflies drives their populations and increases them. And this is something that I would mm. love to try to you know, see if that's true. But I think it's possible because it is a really good resource. I watch them. I have an ash tree, which I've been saving from the emerald ash borers by treating and but the lantern flies are in it and they're dripping all over the place and here come the yellow jackets feeding on the honeydew so that's that's one hypothesis also possibly because it was so dry it provides them just with better forage that's another but again don't know the answer dylan do you have the picture of the leaf uh that had the uh little tent on it uh, that you sent to me oh what, what is that Bobby? that is a spotted lanternfly egg mass and that is what we're going to start seeing soon so when they're first laid 
they're kind of white, but they turn gray over time. So the eggs are under this waxy coating. So if you see those, feel free to. How uh, big? What is the dimension? It's about at? an inch or a little longer. Okay. Yeah. And just squish it or? Scrape it. Scrape it. If you have a good old hotel key that you brought with you, you know, a nice plastic card, they're mm -hmm. perfect. And just, that'll kill it? Just oh, by yeah, taking yeah. it up the just, tree? Yeah, just. <laughs> All right. Sound effects not included. All right. Very good. All right. Uh, what is the next invasive bug that we are expecting or having to deal with? Oh, my goodness. I don't know. Oh, so that's good. So we're just yeah. stuck on the lantern fly. Yeah, now. we are. So I'm, I'm hoping nothing um, because that would be nice. You know, we've been chasing around these invasives and it, you know, there's still problems with even our native pests that I'd like to be able to spend more time on as well. I noticed the more you talk, the more your stink bugs move. I think they are responding to your voice like you're well, their mother or yeah. something. Yeah. Mother of they stink imprinted. bugs. Yeah. Like. Another good name for them. <laughs> There, Tracy, there's there's a thought that these infestations move geographically the north, south, east, to yeah. west. And so stink bugs, a few years ago, we had the infestation here, and then farther south, they mm -hmm. migrated. Do we, can we expect the same thing with landing flies? Yeah, so what we refer to that as, is, and what we're seeing is human-mediated human uh, transport. So we actually did a study this past two years looking at the speeds in which the insects can cling to vehicles or be dislodged. Yeah. <laughs> this is what I got to hear. <laughs> I better just set this one up. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, our engineers developed this laminar flow fan that we could crank up at, you know, so we could get to speeds at which you would travel on highways and things like that. And the, the part that's pretty scary, but it's typical for invasive um, and co ecology is that, it, and it's the rare events that are important because those are what start new populations. The bugs could cling to pretty much any region on our Ford Escape um, for at 60 miles an hour easily. And some could just hang on forever, like if they got down in the window well or something mm -hmm. like that. But even on the side panel on the hood, some, some life stages could hang on there for a very long time. Wow, so, that's impressive. So that... that information then is fed into modeling that allows us to predict spread and also where you know we should concentrate efforts to try to reduce any new populations are these uh, species affected by heat uh, we had a uh, very hot summer especially in some parts of the country does it uh, affect the population in a positive or negative way so we're still trying to figure that out um, but we do know that with lanternfly, they de typically like shady areas. They don't like being exposed in heaty, like sort of hot conditions. So I don't think it was the most favorable summer for them, but I can't say that definitively. We definitely still are in the uptick as far as overall population. And when we get uh, horrible storms, hurricanes and, and mm -hmm. such, do, does that affect uh, this population? Do, do many of them die during those things or do they able to withstand wind and water? They are able to withstand the elements to a certain degree. It depends on what they're doing. So right now, especially with females laying eggs, that's a pretty vulnerable life stage for them. So um, because they're kind of exposed, they're sitting there for a while trying to, you know, put this egg mass on some surface. So I would say we'll see. We'll see. How about yeah. cold weather? When can we expect to see a decrease in them? So every frost, we see fewer and fewer. Some will actually die in place still feeding on the tree. So the latest we've seen them in the field to date is early December. Are you cool. talking lantern flies? Lantern flies. Okay. Stink bugs are in bed by yeah. then. Yeah. 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 They're sleeping in, in your in house. In my bed. In <laughs> your yeah. house. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> going, going back to the European hornets, I'm finding more and more on my sidewalk in the morning. So I assume that's because of the cold weather? Yes. Uh, yes. I'm talking about being dead now or in the dying process. Yeah, yeah. so at this point, everybody is sort of um, dying off and only yeah. the queens will survive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Okay, I'm just looking at some other things that uh, they have here on. I, I had a stink bug holding on for dear life on ID1 going 75 miles <laughs> <Yes>. an hour. <laughs> Can't imagine. So that, uh, will the lantern fly be permitted to join NATO is one of the questions. That Damon, Damon uh, Jeff Haddix actually asked that question. I don't know. I don't know if they've submitted an application or not. I really can't answer that. Now, there's also a request to free your stink bugs. And I assume Ken Matson told about freeing your stink bugs in place. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Just go well, down that, that's go down to the lower that's studio. Nice if I, if, crevices if, under your... If, yeah. right if, I, if I take Ken's statement verbally... 
and I, I think he means it. It should be freed in place, Rob. I think there's a new thing. They're the, closer to you than they are to me, Bill. <laughs> for the county fair, we uh -huh. can sell little stink bugs on a stick, <laughs> and they just fly in circles. <laughs> That's right? a wonderful it's, thought. Yeah. Okay, and, and we'll know how far they'll, we we'll know they'll be all night long because they'll go 45 miles. How many times have you been sprayed by a stink bug? Oh, so many. And you know that it's actually an alarm pheromone to other um, stink bugs. So this little, I have like a tube in there that yes. came from paper towels because I'm high tech sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I put something <laughs> in the bottom and that's how I go around and collect them. But once one of the individuals releases their defensive compounds, whenever I get near one, they just jump away. But I, my postdoc, Laura Nixon, who's been here with me before, um, she found that it is actually an alarm pheromone. It makes them move away. So, so, yeah. so when they spray it, they move away from their own scent? When they, no, when they, when they scent it, they move away. They know mm -hmm. danger is near. Oh, okay. Are there bugs you won't go near that just kind of gross you out? Is, is there a... Mm, I can't think of any. Okay. Yeah, I don't like slugs so much, but they're not insects or even arachnids, so... But, no. No, pretty much anything. I'm a little leery of yellow jackets and hornets only because I have an allergy. But other than that, I'm pretty much in with anything. Let's talk yellow jackets. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm yeah, joking. yeah, yeah, yeah. Bill has many nests. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Tracy, great to see you again. As always, Likewise. you're very informative and incredibly entertaining. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. If you don't mind uh, uh, sharing the story of your childhood when you would see spiders before you go. Oh, well, spiders, I mean, for me and my mother very much was, were, was willing to let me collect just about anything. So spiders, fireflies, whatever. I had a little bug zoo. So I would collect them, bring them in, and then, you know, I, I was allowed to observe them maybe 24 hours, and then my mother would make me let them go. So, yeah. So what, what sparked the interest in bugs as a young child? Uh, probably monarchs or, or uh, fireflies. Fireflies, just as an FYI, fireflies. I'm sorry. Okay. Fireflies, I used to collect them. I would count the number I'd put in my bug zoo. In the morning, I would get up. There would always be fewer, and I was afraid my mother would find out that there were fewer, and she'd think they got out. But what happened is different species of fireflies will prey on each other, so they were eating each other in my bug zoo. Yeah. Or you mentioned monarchs. Are we losing our monarchs? Well, it, I know from some colleagues the counts are down, so mm -hmm. I don't know if the the jury's still out but yeah monarchs was my very first show and tell mm. project in kindergarten yeah. Yeah. i see very few of them now yeah. yeah a couple of years ago i saw a lot so i don't know if it's just the weather yeah. this yeah. year it'll it's more to come on that tracy thank you very much you're welcome dr tracy lesky